Hello and welcome to another installment of Conservation Conversations with BirdLife South Africa. I'm your host, Melissa House whitecross and tonight we're in for something a little different, as you've already heard in the build-up to this webinar, but I hope that you are all as excited as I am. Now, before we dive in, I'd like to say a big thank you to all of you who've generously contributed to the production of these webinars uh, using the Quicket QR code, which you can see on the screen at the moment. Your support is greatly appreciated. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, Zoom allows you to communicate to, with us through the chat room and I see some of you have already started posting your comments there but you can also post your questions using the Q&A box. If you have a toggle around your Zoom screen you'll find a little Q&A symbol. Please just click on that once you're ready to start asking some questions from our illustrious speakers this evening and we'll process <coughs> those at the end of the talk. Now at the end of our webinar you'll be directed to a quick survey. Please consider filling this in. It only takes three minutes and it helps us to continue bringing you a high quality webinar series. Your feedback is really important to us. So thank you to those of you who fill them in every week. Please remember that BirdLife South Africa is running several competitions at the moment, including the Jackpot Birding Raffle, where you could stand the chance to win a 100,000 Rand cash prize or just 500 Rand a ticket. And we also have our Conservation League Donors competition, where if you sign up before the end of August this year, you could win a brand new pair of Zeiss binoculars. Now tonight, we look forward to learning a little bit more about two of Southern Africa's golfing greats and their interest in birds. I'd like to welcome Tony Johnston and Mark McNulty and thank them for joining us this evening. Mark Anderson, BirdLife South Africa's CEO, will be interviewing these two golf icons. And I'd like to welcome Mark as well, who's back for his second appearance on Conservation Conversations. If you happen to miss Mark's debut webinar, which is all about the BirdLife Global Partnership and conserving our world's birds, you can watch this on the BirdLife South Africa YouTube channel, or you can find it on our Conservation Conversations website. Now I'd like to welcome Mark Squared and Tony, and I'm gonna hand over to Mark to get this interview <laughs> underway. Enjoy everybody. Okay, thanks Melissa, and appreciate it. Yeah, it's an incredible honor for me tonight to be interviewing and talking to two of my golf heroes. I've been heroes for a long time, and I've, you know, I'm a golf fanatic, spent many hours watching golf on television, and I've often been rooted to the telly when they've been in the running for a, a tournament. So it's an absolute privilege to be interviewing you both. And not only do we share an interest in golf, but we also share an interest in birds. And that's the reason why we've come together tonight. Yeah. But just um, about myself, I have um, come from a golfing family. And I've spent many hours on the golf course, particularly when I was in school and in my early 20s. And I used to play at Wingate Park Country Club in Pretoria. And then for two years, I was the assistant at Simon Hobday's Pro Shop. <laughs> that was, oh, and that was a, an interesting time and maybe there will be some Simon stories uh, during this uh, this interview so it's um, a real pleasure to to welcome uh, Tony and Mark two of the most successful golfers that have ever come out of southern Africa and particularly out of Zimbabwe and I think we all know that there's other golfers like Nick Price and Dennis Hutchinson who've also originated from Zimbabwe so just as an introduction to introduce our two guests tonight Mark has won 59 professional tournaments. His best performance, I believe, was the, at a major, where he tied second at the Open Championship in 1990. He's won many tournaments in South Africa, including the then Million Dollar Golf Challenge back in 1986. And the reason Mark is with us tonight is because he loves the outdoors and his interests are, amongst others, bird photography and scuba diving. These days, he spends a lot of time behind his camera photographing I asked him today which were his most pleasing wins, and he said two SA Opens and two Volvo PGA Championships. <clears throat> Tony's well known for his uh, excellent short game, and I must say also his Fred Astaire moves when he was addressing the <laughs> golf ball, and I'm thinking I'll probably rag him about that later. Tony currently works as a golf commentator for Sky Sports, and he was also a presenter for a television series called Bush Hacking, which is filmed both in the Kruger National Parks and in Shambwari, Shambwari being one of Tony's favorite places. Tony's current passion is birding, and he's recently, in fact, in the last week, acquired some really top photographic equipment, and he's been spending time in his garden in Sunningdale in England, where he's um, joining us from, practicing his bird photography. So that's an introduction, and welcome, guys, and thank you very, very much um, for your time. So uh, you know, maybe we'll start with a couple of questions around golf. We're going we're gonna to bounce around um, asking various questions. 
and maybe starting um, with you, um, Mark, are there any golf courses in the world which are particularly good for watching birds? Sure. You know, as far as I can remember, one of my best golf courses is Hilton Head Island. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a golf course which is right on the water. It goes inland a little bit, a lot of lakes on the golf course. And yeah, I, I can remember playing there a number of times and bird life there is fantastic. But you know, golf courses do lend themselves to birds. So it's just wonderful for me, having loved my birds from when I was in my early teens, um, to play golf and have the opportunity to watch birds as we play. Yeah, yeah. Tony, do you have a favorite golf course where you watch birds? Leopard Creek. Leopard Creek. Yes. Leopard Creek is just wonderful. You know, when we're doing commentary there, I, I sort of tell a white lie every morning. And at, at the tournaments, you go out every morning to have a look at the pins, but it's the only, only tournament really where I go out to look at pins carrying a pair of binoculars and sometimes a camera. Everybody sees through it, but the bird life there is just to die for. Okay. And you know, there's a few golf courses. I mean, Sun City obviously being one where, you know, when I watch golf on television, I hear a lot of birds calling orange breasted bushrikes and, and many others. But just in Johannesburg, the Royal Johannesburg and Kensington Golf Club, has a lot of bird life and in fact there's now um, nesting long crested eagles believe it or not so quite a lot of bird life wow. down there. So, Joburg, Country, one, Joburg Country Club as well Mark my great friend who's tuned in Colin Little who I stay with in Joburg um, he's often sending me messages about rarities that they see at uh, Country Club it's fantastic with their golf courses there the bird life as well so yeah. golf and birding there's a very mix. active there's a very active bird club at um, Country Club Johannesburg too, and they mm. do they lead morning walks. So, and a few of the members are actually have joined us. Now, I know a hole in one um, is only an eagle, not an albatross. But do you, do you two keep records of your holes in one? Do you know how many you've scored over the years? TJ, yeah, I've had uh, six holes in one and one albatross. That's it. Um, one I've albatross had only. Seventeen. And one albatross as well. Oh, you've always got a top me, McNulty, haven't you? No, no, that, that's just one albatross. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we, should, we should have had John Bland on here, Mark, because he's, <laughs> he's had something like, I think he said 35 or 36. No, he's, had, he's had a lot, hasn't he, Tony? A lot oh, of oh, it's unbelievable. Every time he hits it, it goes in the hole. He's not good, he's lucky. <laughs> So, so why are there so many good golfers that emanate from Southern Africa? You look at the number from, from Zimbabwe, there's at least four or five top golfers. South Africa has many. What, what is it? Is, it? is it the air we breathe? Is it the water we drink? Why do we have so many top golfers? Weather. I weather. definitely think weather has a lot to do with that. And junior programs. When, when I was growing up in yeah. Zim and in South Africa at that stage, way back, they had great junior programs, and I still think to this day they have great junior programs. Yeah, that could be, yeah, that's the reason. And uh, when I did talk to Tony about this earlier as well, he also said biltong. <laughs> we eat lots of biltong. Could be one of <laughs> one of the reasons. So, Tony, you've been involved with BirdLife South Africa for a, a few years now, and hmm. got I got to meet you through the Ruperts, through Gaynor Rupert, who's one of our four honorary patrons. And at that stage, you were vice captain of the international side and the President's Cup. And you had money to donate to a, to a charitable cause, to an organization of your choice. You very, very generously donated over two years more than half a million rand to, to BirdLife South Africa, which we're very grateful for. So why us? Because you, you're so handsome, Mark. <laughs> <Thank> you. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, Mark, I, I mean, I, I've got into birding about 20 years ago from uh, because of my good friend colin little um you know and colin has subscribed to in in the old days before it became bird life um african bird life magazine it was uh, south african birding i think he subscribed to that for about well from day one um you know got into the bird he used to read the magazines and you know articles on conservation etc and it's just you know bird life is just such an an, inter, an integral part of the ecosystem. You know, without guys like you and the help from people like us, uh, you know, it's very easy to lose, lose a lot of bird species, which is, is a tragedy. And, you know, as you said, um, Mark was a vice captain as well. 
we got a stipend to give to charities and good causes. Uh, you know, we gave to charities and Zim, etc. But this was one of my chosen my chosen causes. I think you guys do an absolutely wonderful job. Really a wonderful job. And we appreciate that support, Tony. And for you know, those who don't know us, you know, we were formed originally in 1905, so a very long time ago. Initially, as the South African Ornithologist Union, became BirdLife South Africa in 1996, one of more than 120 BirdLife partners around the world. And our, our work is really to conserve uh, the world's birds. And I think we do that admirably. Mm -hmm. and lots of conservation successes. So Mark, Mark, your main interest is actually photography. And I can see there's some really good uh, gear behind you there. Um, so tell us about your photographic hobby. And Well, well, <laughs> it, first, it first started a number of years ago, taking a camera underwater. And uh, then I got to realize with Tony used to play in them as well. We used to do Canon shootouts around the world with for Canon. And uh, when I used to get Canon cameras, it was a, an obvious choice to, to take one underwater. And then of course I got into bird photography on top of my younger teen times of collecting birds eggs and, and loving my birds at that stage. And, and now, the thing that I love the most is birds in flight and uh, whether they're big or small, it's, it's a big challenge <laughs> to get birds in flight and to get what you want. So uh, Canon and me have been very happy people for a while and uh, I use a 1DX Mark II and my, I guess my favorite it gets me a long way. So Mark, the, um, the last few weeks we've been exchanging lots of emails and WhatsApp and WhatsApp messages and you've sent me quite a few of your photographs. Your crowned eagles in flight are incredible and I think that'll be a double page spread in our magazine in, in due course. But during mm. lockdown, I know that in the morning walks, you've instead of going for a walk or exercise, you've gone down to the lake and spent the time photographing birds. Is there any particular favorite bird that you've photographed during this lockdown period? Well, you know, <laughs> It's, it's, it's amazing, Mark, you ask that question because I have been dying for a long time to get a half collar kingfisher. Um, and just out of the blue, the last two weeks, these, this pair have been in our Coppice Creek area at San Lamea, and I've taken some magnificent shots of them. You know, we've got, you've got five kingfishers here, and they're all fantastic in their own, own right. But this half collared little guy, it's been very special to take him and uh, I've taken some amazing shots, which I'm, I'm happy about, very happy about. So the, the one you sent me today of the Malachite Kingfisher was outstanding. And I, you know, when I opened it, I actually got very envious that uh, you were able to take such a, a fantastic photograph. It was really <laughs> superb. I mean, that's another award-winning picture. Well done. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so Melissa, I don't know, the images aren't rotating on my screen. And I know that we've planned to include a lot of photographs that would uh, have taken I by... Mark. See that. I see that Mark, I'm yeah. going to fix it in a moment, just carry on. <laughs> Sorry okay. about that. Okay, thanks, thanks very much. Okay, going back to golf, and um, Tony, to you, so if you had to put a, a, an ideal four ball together, so you and three others, um, maybe past and present, um, and I, I saw your tweets in the last week or so about Seve, but mm. who would your ideal four ball be? Uh, Look, I would, I would like to say Mark McNulty, but I wouldn't because he, he puts like a genius and he irritated me enormously. He's the only guy I know that actually puts sunblock on his backside. He spent so much time bending down to take the ball out the hole. So uh, <laughs> I would say my son Dale, Seve, and John Bland. Do you know okay. TJ, I'm a loss for words. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we've got the images now. We've got the images rotating now across the screen, and there will be uh, quite a lot of Mark's uh, photographs that he sent me that were taken at San Lemire Kruger. Um, there's a, mass, a magnificent Vero's Eagle picture that he took at Walter Sassoudi National Botanical Garden. So enjoy the pictures as they rotate. Um, so, Mark, um, your, 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 who would you choice choose to play with in a four ball? Well, definitely not Tony Johnson because he irritated. <laughs> Dickens out of me with his magic Fred Astaire moves. Now, <laughs> all honesty, um, let, let, me, let me think about that one because you've surprised me. That. Definitely, if I had a chance, um, 
I'd like to play with my dad. He, he was unfortunately killed in a shooting accident when I was a year old. Um, ben Hogan, definitely. I never got to meet the great man. And uh, I, I, would, I would go for Bobby Locke. Those would be my three people that I'd like to play. The last round that I was, would ever be able to play golf. Okay, yeah, um, incredible. So um, that's, that's interesting. I've often thought about who I'd like to, to play with, and there's, there's many players. But what's interesting is that both of you as golfers are also keen birders, but I do understand that there are many other sports people who are also interested in, in, uh, in the environment. Hmm. So Louis Oestesen being one, um, Dale Stain being another, Pat Simcox, who hopefully has joined us as well. Pat is uh, also interested in birds. Are there any famous golfers that you know about? Other famous golfers that are keen on birds? Uh, Charles Schwartzel. I mean, he's got his own game reserve, so I would think, uh, you know, he would be. Uh, Karen Kropp, Justin Walters, mad keen on birding, very knowledgeable as well. Uh, but, you know, there's so many. I remember when we used to play the tournament at Palabora, the Pal Palabora Classic in the 80s. I remember playing in the morning and I bumped into Gavin Levinson and Justin Hobday. I was about to go into the park to look at the animals and I said, where are you going? They said, no, we're going into the park to go bird watching. I said, sorry, you know, have you lost the plot? They've got elephants in there, you know, and lions and leopards and you're going to go and look at birds. I just didn't get it at all. And they said, no, we're going to go and look at birds. Uh, and I wish they'd talked me into it uh, all those years ago. Um, and now I can see why they were absolutely fascinated and addicted to it so uh, a lot of a lot of sportsmen um, Mark Boucher he's also very much into conservation loves the bush uh, and loves birding Kevin Peterson very much you know he does a lot for rhino conservation and he's really interested in, in the birds he's he's reignited his interest they've got a he's got a lodge on the side on the edge of the Kruger and that's really kicked off his interest in birding again so it seems to go you know I think a lot of guys sports when they love the outdoors they love being outside and you know it's a natural follow and eventually you fall in love with the wildlife and the game and the birds and why not it's, it's too special not to enjoy and you can only look at sleeping lions so many times huh? yeah exactly and that's all they do <laughs> and you know you, <laughs> you know, when you go to the kruger i mean you know mark and everybody out there you can drive around all day and see you know two impala one kudu and a, a zebra you know you might see nothing but you're always going to see birds and if you're interested in birding the fascination of birds you know the, the colors the songs um you know their habits there's always something to see every every kilometer or two there's a bird what is it and that, that excitement is as as strong i think as seeing you know lions and elephants really it's just uh, i wish I'd, i wish i'd got into this when i was five years of age Yes. So, um, Tony, you do some commentary with Dale, and I've actually listened to you both um, at Sun City, and I think you share the commentary box together occasionally. Yeah. Both great friends. <laughs> is, is Dale a bird watcher at all? Dale Hayes? Uh, no, he's a bird eater, primarily Kentucky Fried, I would think. <laughs> and lots <laughs> of it. Lots of it. I've got to be fair. He and Alice and his wife are mad keen on the bush. So okay. uh, I like giving hazy grief, but they go to the bush a couple of times a year and absolutely love it. They really do. And the late yeah. Simon Hobday, did he ever watch birds? Did he ever get up in time to listen to the dawn chorus? Well, he would have, he would have heard the dawn chorus, but only because he hadn't been to bed yet. He was you know, <laughs> out all night drinking probably and partying. <laughs> So we, there's been a few requests. In fact, you probably saw some of those. And Mark, maybe you've got a yeah. famous Simon Hobday story. There's many Simon Hobday stories. I have a few myself. Do you have any that you could well, tell us? Well, you, you know, my, the famous one of all is when he broke my putter. And uh, <laughs> they set me up perfectly. It was uh, Dale Hayes, Simon Hobday challenged Nick Price and I to a match. We played out in Benoni. And uh, they... they which was the guy emceeing, introducing everybody. And they introduced me as the, one of the greatest putters. And uh, with that, Simon said, no, hang on, hang on. And he walked across my bag, picked out my putter and said, Mark, is this your putter? I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, proud as buck. Well, the next thing, he just snapped it over his knee. 
And he said, well, that's the end of your putter for the day. And of course, I was completely gobsmacked. Didn't know they had substituted my putter. I didn't hold one putt the whole day. <laughs> and we lost the match. Yeah. And that was Simon Hogg there for you. <coughs> Tony, do you, have a, do you have a Simon story? Oh, you know what? Every one of us has got dozens and dozens yeah. of Simon stories. There's got a, you know, it's just, it's, it's the little one-liners. I was, you know, I played uh, a bit with Trevino and he was renowned for his humor, but it was a, a repertoire that started repeating after five or six holes, you know. Hobbes was, as you know, Mark having been his assistant, one line has just came to him out of the blue and I never heard him repeat one, but the one great one was when he, he got stopped by a traffic cop in America and the guy said, uh, I've been waiting all day for someone like you because he was speeding. He says, I know, and I got you for you as fast as I could. I mean, just like that. That was Hob Day. He just came up with answers that, you know, the sort of thing that we would think about three days later, you think, oh, I wish I'd said that. Hobbes had the ability to just come up with him on the dot. He was, he was an absolute legend. We all miss him so much. Yeah, I know. We certainly do. So, t Tony, um, I, you know, I know that you have your Fred Astaire moves, <clears throat> which may <laughs> indicate that you're a twitcher, but are you are a twitcher in the birding sense? Do you keep a list of the birds you see? Um, you know, I mean, it depends what you call a twitcher. In my mind, I sort of think as twitch of twitchers as people that are prepared to travel a long way and spend a lot of money just to see a bird and tick it off. Now, I, I keep a, a list of birds that I've seen, but, you know, not strictly twitcher, twitcher wise. It's always exciting to see a new bird that you haven't seen. But um, I'm not fanatical. When I see a new bird, I'm very excited. Uh, but I just, I just like seeing birds, you know, they're, they're all, every bird, every, every Southern African bird fascinates me. Yeah, you know, we've, my wife and I, Tanya and I have got the same view. We travel quite a bit and mm. when we had a new birding destination, we'd rather see a hundred birds well than you know, 500 badly because there's just so much Absolutely. And fascination of watching them. Yeah. Mark, what is your, what is your favorite bird? Have you got a favorite, a personal favorite? I've got a few. So quickly, when I was a uh, early teens, it used to be the African wood hoopoe because of the golf course in Centenary. Then late, later teens, when I was collecting birds' eggs, the African jacana used to be the one egg that I really wanted. That was a fascinating bird. Then when we got into the game reserve, the woodland kingfisher, how can you not like that fish? I mean, that yeah. bird, it's just unbelievable bird. We all know it's shrill. But living at San Lomir, I have to put top of the list the crown eagle. They are just so magnificent, and to watch them raise their young is amazing. So there's actually quite a few photographers living at San Lemire, what I gather. So it's, you know, the hobby seems to be catching on there. Yeah, a lot of guys, I love it. I mean, obviously I've got a couple of good, very good photographer friends who live in Marina Beach, Shark Shell Shop, I think you know um, yes. Mark, and uh, a couple of our members here, they love their bird photography. I know one, one friend, Peter Wright, I think he's, he's upwards of nearly 500 birds that he's actually photographed. I'm not near that, but uh, that's to say you've got a photograph of 500 birds. It's quite amazing in by itself. It's mm. incredible. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to see the interest in bird photography and how it's growing. And what has amazed uh, BirdLife South Africa over the last few years in particular is the growth in bird watching amongst the youth. You have the sort of 10 to 30 year olds, just incredible how it's grown and we're not really sure why it's probably worthy of a study but i think a lot of these people have cameras a lot of them are twitching a lot of them involved in citizen science projects but there's a there's a real growing interest in in birds and mm. um, mark so i think a lot of people will be listening will be quite envious of the photographs that are being shown on the screen mm. um any budding photographer somebody who wants to maybe start this hobby what would be your initial advice to them just shoot, keep on shooting, and then keep on shooting more. But uh, the, one, the one thing I keep on telling people is get off auto, get off auto and shoot manual as, and learn how to do that as quick as you can. When you, when you get control of the camera in your hands, it's amazing what you can do. And uh, that seems to go all around the world. When you speak to photographers, they will always say, get off auto, Get onto manual as soon as you can. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, there's a famous Gary Player saying when he, you know, he hit a difficult shot and it ended up next to the pin. 
somebody commented, yeah, lucky shot. And you know, I think your response was, it's interesting that the more I practice, the luckier I get. I think it's the same um, in bird photography as well. The more time we spend behind our cameras and the more time we spend out there trying to get those photographs, you know, the greater likelihood of getting good photos. Absolutely. That, yeah. That's what it's all about. Practice, practice, practice. And then practice more. Yeah. I've, I've had some port or I've got some portable bird hides which I've put up at strategic places to photograph birds and, you know, sitting in them early morning before the sun rises. And I've just been, you know, been really pleased with what I see in front of me, just the watching the bird behavior and seeing characteristics of birds that I wouldn't have seen unless I was actually trying to, to photograph them. Um, Tony, so I don't know, the UK, the RSPB, which is our sister organization, is much bigger than BirdLife South Africa. They have over a million members. We only have 6,000 odd members. And the RSPB encourages bird feeding. And in mm. fact, you know, in South Africa, we do too. In our little shop at our office in Dunkeld West, we do sell bird feeders and bird food. And uh, Tanya and I also feed the birds in our garden. Do you have bird feeders up in your garden in, in the UK? Mark, if it wasn't for the birds in my garden and the amount I feed them, I would be retired now. I would be sitting on an island somewhere. Because I spend about 50 or 60 pounds a, a, a month on bird feed. Uh, but um, I love it. I love it. I have about... 14 or 15 feeders around the garden and it's just a delight you know you can sit at uh, any window in the house and the birds are flying in and you know it's mainly um songbirds little garden birds uh and it's it's worth the investment i absolutely love it and uh always have so in the in the, in the summer months you know in johannesburg and mm. elsewhere in south africa if you put out feed the birds won't come to the food necessarily but the winter months like now, if you put out suet balls, you know, they'll flock there and they'll devour them. Because this is obviously a bottleneck period for birds and it's a good time to feed them. People often ask me, you know, should they feed birds and how regularly? My standard response is yes, feed them. Um, you know, you grow indigenous plants in your garden. There's many indigenous plants which provide food for birds. But feed them, and, but just don't feed them every day. You know, take a couple of days break so they don't necessarily become better accustomed to the food that you're providing. <laughs> I'm sure it's okay. <laughs> so Mark, Mark, we're in lockdown at the moment and BirdLife South Africa's offices have been closed for about 10 weeks now. Most of the people have been confined to their homes. The rules are changing on 1st of June and you've been locked down in San Lemaire. But if you had one place that you could be anywhere in the world right now, anywhere in Africa, where would that place be? Phew, I would, uh, you know, apart from San Lomé, I'd have to join Tony at, at Leopard Creek. There's, uh, there's no doubt about that. I mean, obviously, we all know the bird life there is fantastic. And uh, phew, the river's there, game the other side. That's most probably where I'd like to be. Yeah, yeah. Are you, Tony? Uh, well, either in the Kruger or down at Shamwari. Uh, I've got a friend who's got a game reserve in Zim. I spent some time there as well, uh, just outside Arari. Basically, somewhere in the bush. I just want to be in the bush. Uh, it's the only place, I suppose, that I feel I, I really fit. And I've never really liked cities. I'm a bit of a country bumpkin coming from Bulawayo and Zim. We lived out of town a bit. Uh, yeah, I just anywhere in, in the bush felt will do me. Just take me away, Mark. Right, lift the restrictions, bring us out there. We're ready. <laughs> <laughs> and you, oh. you can imagine how nice it would be to be in Kruger now when the, you know, it's closed to visitors oh. and you have the place to yourself. <laughs> yeah, yes. fantastic. We, we watch um, you know, the wild earth every morning and evening. Uh, it gives us our little, little boost. We, w we would have actually been getting back from Kruger yesterday. We, uh, my wife, Karen, and I were going to be in, in Kruger for uh, eight or nine days. But obviously it hasn't happened. We'll have to postpone it to later in the year, but uh, it'll still be there and it'll still be wonderful. Yeah, Mark? Well, you know, you, you, you're alluding to this fact of favorite places. Well, one thing that Alice and I used to love doing in the Kruger is just to drive somewhere, park the car, open the windows and listen. Mm. And it was like 99 times out of 100 the first thing you'd hear would be a bird and it's call, and then all the others. So that is one thing that I really love about Kruger 
yeah, the big game's great, but just to listen to the birds and yeah. all the sounds that they make. And that woodland kingfisher will never leave your brain. <laughs> I am... Um, I often think about, you know, when the lockdown ends and people are able to travel and we open up to tourism again, people are going to be desperate to get into the bush. And you know, Kruger is you know, in a dire position at the moment because they haven't been generating revenue for over two months. Mm. I think uh, and hopefully they'll make up for that uh, with time. So, yeah, it's uh, certainly difficult as well. Everybody's itching to, to get out into the bush. And you can just imagine this time of the year in winter, it's mm. a time that a lot of people certainly get into the bush. Best time, particularly to get into the, the malaria areas. Yeah. Going back to golf, Tony, um, I mean, I'm sure you've been given lots of advice, some of it chirps, I suppose, as you've played. But what's the best advice you've ever been given by another golfer or maybe by your coach? Um, well, you get a lot of advice along the way. I think I came with Mark McNulty. We played in eight World Cups together, and he tried desperately to try and rein in my temper. He would say, just calm down, which of course infuriated me even more. But it was actually the best advice. It was the best advice anyone gave me. Unfortunately, I just didn't listen to him. <laughs> but you don't have that temper anymore, He's though, fortunately. <laughs> no, that's only because I don't play, Mark. If I went out on the golf course now, I'd still behave like a child. The, the game got the better of me mentally. Uh, I loved it. I loved competing. But it did drive me to distraction. My friends know that, so uh, I admit to it readily. <laughs> when, when last did you play, Tony? Uh, we play, I play two or three games every Easter when we go on holiday to Mauritius. But other than that, five years. After I retired, um, you know, when I, I pulled the plug, I, I said to my wife, Karen, 20 years ago, the day uh, the frustration outweighs the pleasure. I'm, I'm done and dusted because I, I love golf as a, a tool to compete. I still I love being I love the game. I just don't love playing it. I love being involved with it, with the commentary. Uh, a lot of you know, obviously, a lot of friends I've made uh, through golf. You're out there mixing with the youngsters. They keep you young at heart. Although they call me grandpa when I walk down the range now, cheeky little so and so. Um, yeah, I, I still love the game. I just don't. I just don't play it. I just don't. And you know. Mark will, Mark will understand this. Look, Mark's kept himself uh, really sharp with his game anyway. But you get to a point where, you know, you see a shot that you hit your whole life that you knew you could hit. And you know, I'm just going to get it off the back foot, low rising fade with a six yard swing, tuck it into that right flag. And, you know, you get up when you don't play a lot and you, you get everything feels great until you hit it. And it takes off with a snap hook straight left into the trees and no 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 enough of that i'll go i'll go and join mark with his photography much better so tony if we may ask your last game in mauritius what did you score um and that's gross not net uh, <laughs> you know uh, uh a lot I, I scored a lot let's leave it at that. <laughs> big numbers i you know i was never a real uh a natural golfer you know i got to where i did through hard work i had an unorthodox action um uh, mark's you know a much more orthodox player and uh, he's the man's got a touch he's got a gift of touch uh, that is really seen in in other human beings give give mark mcnulty a snooker cue when he hasn't played snooker for 10 years and he'll reel off a 60 break. Put him in front of a piano and he hasn't played the piano for 10 years and he'll play you whatever you like. Mark has got fantastic, fantastic touches. Um, nice. and, he's got the, and he's got the brain for it. You know, if, if Mark missed a putt, he moved off to the next. If he missed a three-footer, it didn't phase him. The rest of us would be spitting feathers, but he would just go on and just hold the next 20 in a row. So very strong mentally as Mr. McNulty. Yeah, I was spitting feathers inside. I might have looked up, but I was spitting feathers inside. I promise you. Uh, Mark, you never let on. You never let on. <laughs> yeah. So, Mark, what's the best advice you've been given, and who was that by? Sure. You, you really caught me with that one. Um, you know, when, when, when I was a, a kid growing up, um, there was a, a, an old Scottish pro who used to come out to Centenary and, and teach us. And... Uh, he said to me, just like Ben Hogan said, Mark, if you want to be good in this good old Scottish action, you want to be good at this game, it's all in the dirt. I, and I, I promise you, I must have been about nine then. I said, what do you mean by in the dirt? He said, if you make divots, that's dirt. 
that's how you're going to make your life. Which, because I think it was about that time when I'd watched Gary play and Arnold Palmer in an exhibition in, in Harare. And that's a kind of, that cemented my said to me, practice. So one of the, um, I mean, we get a lot of calls to our office. I don't know, the answering machine at the office, the fact that we haven't been there for, for 10 weeks must be quite full of messages. And one of the standard things from the golf courses is, you know, what do we do with the, about the Egyptian geese? Egyptian geese and, and golfers are not best friends. And uh, I think that's got a lot to do about them pooping on the, um, on the, on the greens as well and uh, missing a putt, a short putt, thanks to an Egyptian goose. But um, <laughs> that's been a quite an interesting thing we've had to deal with over the, while, over the last while. But what we've been encouraged by <clears throat> is the number of golf courses that are becoming you know, more environmentally friendly, if I can call it that. And, there's an Audubon accreditation now. There's other forms of accreditation that one can apply for. And Royal Johannesburg and Kensington being <clears throat> one, where they're now planting indigenous plants. They're recycling their, um, their water. They are putting up nest boxes and they're not using poisons anymore. And, you know, that's really encouraging. Because golf courses are obviously known to be water thirsty, um, the old days in any case. And it's, it's really encouraging to see the change and I'm sure that's going to increase in future. And and bird uh, golf courses can certainly provide um, habitat for birds. So, yeah, Mark, yeah. that uh, that Audubon Society uh, rating, man, that, that is a tough thing to achieve, isn't it? I remember speaking to Johan Rupert. They were they were they were getting trying to get the Audubon Society rating for mm -hmm. Leopard Creek. And it's it's wonderful the stuff that you have to do, as you said, you know, no chemicals, no poisons. Um, and you know they did achieve it at Leopard Creek, but man, you've got to abide by the rules, and you've got to you've got to be unbelievably eco-friendly. It's a great thing, isn't it? Absolutely. We've we've often wondered whether we, as a conservation, a bird conservation NGO, should have a you know closer relationship with golf courses. You know, one idea I've had is to have a, a box in the nineteenth hole where people could put their change in. You know, for every birdie in the round, they maybe put in five rand and. Every eagle they put in twenty or an albatross a hundred, for example, and we could generate funds for for conservation mm. that way. And I've often thought the scorecards that you know, we write our scores in, if maybe the back of the card had a list of the common birds that are present at the golf course, and then people could mark them off. Mm. So we could collect information that way about the most common birds on the golf courses, and also it would encourage people, you know, while they're waiting at the tee to waiting for others to tee off, they could uh, look around and look at the birds and. And these days as well, you've got a lot of you know, pocket binoculars that are you know, more compact and you know, mm. ones that you can put in the golf course. It'd be nice to see more and more golfers taking the, the binoculars along and when, mm. they, when they play. That's a cool idea, Mark, about birds on the, on the back of mm. a golf scorecard. That's a cool idea. So maybe you could encourage San Lemire and South Broome. <laughs> maybe there's something they could do. So we, we're going to open up to questions in a moment, and I see there's quite a few already. But I just wanted to maybe end, um, you know, you mentioned the Dawn Chorus and the, and the fact that Simon probably hasn't, didn't ever hear it. <laughs> and Mark, you said um, you and your wife, one of your favorite times is driving into Kruger and finding a place to sit quietly and listen to the birds calling. That's certainly one of uh, my special times. Yeah. But I often use the analogy of Rachel Carson's book, uh, The Silent Spring, which she wrote a, a very long time ago. And she spoke about the the negative effects of agricultural pesticides, particularly DDT and dildrin and other organic chlorines, what they were having on the environment and calling egg, causing eggshell thinning and peregrines. And she said, if we continue using organic chlorine pesticides as we were then, one day there'll be a silent spring. And I think about a, a silent dawn and, and waking up to, um, to no bird sound. And that, that really gets me up in the morning and encourages me to continue doing what I do I think a lot of our staff are also encouraged to, to do their work and to do it well, is that it would be a horrible legacy to leave future generations um, a silent dawn. The, the dawn chorus is, is incredible. And, and unless we, we undertake our important bird conservation work, there's a chance. Some parts of the world, there'll be no dawn chorus in the morning. And what a horrible indictment on us as the current generation to leave future generations a silent dawn. Uh, the, any closing statements or comments you'd like to make before we do open up to questions we've been going for 40 minutes that was our aim and sure. uh, there's quite a few questions coming through 
So should we go to those? I'm going to have a look at that. Um, so Graham Addy, is that his name, um, Tony? Yeah. He asked if you can remember the flocks of abdom stalks and white stalks on the school fields in Bulawayo. Uh, I, I, I didn't know what they were at the time, but I can remember, absolutely. I can remember there were storks all over the place. I wish I'd paid more attention. Um, I see a lot of um, abdoms um, actually at the airport in Harare when I go and uh, visit friends up there. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, we just took it for granted in those days. You know, we used to get the um, scaly feathered finch. You know, they were all over the place. And I've been trying to find one and see one again for years now and i can't see i haven't seen one anywhere we just took it for granted you know birds in the bush oh well they, they're just there uh it's a great thing to get your kids interested too that's that that's our next generation of conservationists we need to get them involved okay, then. Those, those admin stalks mark they they used to be a sure sign up in zim of rain mm. coming okay so one of the Always. one of the rain birds mark mm. there's a Jeremy Exelby, I'm not sure how to pronounce his surname, but he's asking, have you ever patted on sand since, since your Waterford days? Now, I'm not sure who he's asking. <laughs> That's me, Jeremy Exelby, man. Yeah, we used to play junior golf together at a little golf course way out of town called uh, Waterford Golf Course. Uh, sand greens, I sort of learned to play on sand greens. So hello, Jeremy. Um, no, actually, uh, no I, I, I lie. I played on in a... In a um, sort of fun event in Saudi Arabia about 10 years ago. And they had these oil slick greens, um, black, black oil sand. So that was the only time, but it was a great learning experience learning on the sand, sand greens. It definitely taught you to be a positive putter. You had to give it a real slam at the back of the hole. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there's, a, there's a comment all the way from Barbados, and I think it's from um, Neville Isdal, who's one of our donors. He's in lockdown in Barbados. And he says, not a question, but to show the long reach of Simon Hobde, he taught me golf at the Lusaka Golf Club in Zambia as a wow. favor to my brother in the early 1970s. Needless to say, I never really learned to play, but we did have fun and mentioning him brought back happy memories. So that's uh, Neville and wow. his wife, Pamela Isdall, probably joining us from, from Barbados. That's Fantastic. That's so the, there's a question. Uh, Eleanor Mary Cattle, um, Marcus said, gorgeous photos. Um, thank you. Okay, and in fact, that question came from Pamela. She, Pamela has sent a message. So Pamela sent the, the question, not um, Neville. So Pamela, thanks very much. I didn't realize that you, you'd been taught by Simon. <laughs> um, Peter Wright has asked, can you guys give us an idea of the best golfing birding tours you would recommend in Southern Africa? I don't think we have such things in Southern Africa. No, I can't say. I think it's a great idea. I mean, you know, you're, you're out there in the wild, you're out there in the in the open air, and you know, we we mentioned earlier in the webinar some of the the golf courses like uh, Royal Joburg Joburg uh, Country Club, Leopard Creek. You know, some of the courses uh, East London. I remember we did the had the Africa Open down there. Um, so many golf courses with so much bird life. Why not com uh, combine the two? Good idea. Yeah. You know, Mark, another really good golf course is, is Plettenberg Country Club. Wow. Okay. They've got greenback camaropteras, um, mm. nice lurries, they've got the works there, babblers, the works, it's unbelievable. Warblers as well, it's unbelievable. So, so, so Mark, yeah, that's you, a very good idea. I have to think about, I'll have to talk to Peter about that. So if you took your camera gear with you while you were playing, you'd need a very strong caddy, I think. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Warren Funston, who works at Eskom, who's a, a very um, big supporter of our organization and is a golfer himself, has asked them, to either one of you, have you ever been distracted on the course during a tournament by a bird? And, you know, maybe that bird has been a life. Has, have, maybe, Tony, have you ever been distracted by a bird? Are we talking about feathered birds here now? <laughs> <laughs> Mark, you know, I, I, there, you know, a lot of guys on tour have a lot of golf dreams and I never, ever dreamt about golf. But I had this one recurring dream for about, it must have been eight or nine years. I was in the final tier at Swartkop's Country Club, Dale Hayes' course. The 18th hole used to be the little dog leg left to right and you used to drive over a, um, a water hazard that ran across the fairway, you know, 150 yards off the tee. And I had this recurring dream. Late afternoon, I could hear the 
cake turtle dance, you know, work harder, work harder in the background. And I would hit this tee shot with a one shot lead and it would get over the hazard and slam into a dove and straight in the, in the water and I would lose the tournament. And I finally got there the one year, uh, one shot lead over Dennis Durney and got over my tee shot and damn, if this Cape Turtle Dove doesn't start right next to the tee. And I had to back off. I thought, this is it. This is the premonition. This, I'm go- this thing's going to cost me the tournament. Anyway, I, I managed to hit it. But uh, that was about the closest I got to a distraction from a bird. <laughs> <laughs> has, it, has a bird ever made off with your ball? Uh, no, I haven't had it. I don't know if you have Mark Crows are the, the big culprits for that, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. And is seagulls. It, uh, they try and pick them yeah, up. True. Too. true. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've seen it, of, but it's never happened to me. There's a couple of comments here that um, are relevant to to both of you, well, to one of you. Oh, this one's to Mark. Hi, Mark. Any fond memories of Teeth of the Dog in the Dominican Republic? It's oh, from goodness. Robbie Mayer. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, was, uh, that was a hell of a good <coughs> We had a hell of a week. Uh, you know, I haven't got any fond bird memories of that week, but certainly of the golf course in particular, I can't remember the actual hole, but a par three that played over the ocean. But wow, that was a, a long time memory. I think 1974, if my memory corrects me. <laughs> okay, so some, there's a question from Eleanor Mary Cattle, Cattle about an albatross. What is an albatross? Remind me in golfing terms what an albatross is. So I don't know which of you, who you'd like to answer that. I'll go with that. Uh, okay. That basically, each hole is given a par. So a par four uh, allocates you two shots to get to the green, and every hole uh, you're entitled to two putts theoretically. So a par four is two shots to get to the green, two putts, par four. Par five, three shots, blah, blah, blah. So an albatross is basically a birdie is if you go one under par. On a par four, if you make three, that's a birdie. An albatross is if you go two under par, and your hole... Um, a, 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 sorry, an, an eagle is two under par, an albatross is three under par. So you've either got to hold your tee shot on a par four or your second shot on a par five. And they are both extremely rare, way, way, way rarer than holes in one, much rarer. Mark and I have had one each in our lives, uh, just to give you an idea how really it happens. So albatross so why, is good. So why don't the Americans use the term albatross? They use the term double eagle. Uh, we're talking the Americans. Uh, they're Americans. <laughs> <laughs> you, you're going to get us into trouble here, Mark. Yeah, now rather, <laughs> it could be a few Americans listening. So there's a few people. Chris Gordon Williams is saying Royal Cape has uh, fabulous raptors and um, great for black sparrowhawks. Oh. And we did mention um, the uh, the long crested eagles at Royal Johannesburg. And then somebody mentioned the, the Palmerate Vultures uh, mark at San Lemire and Southbrim, which is um, obviously of, of, of interest to you. And we've then got a, somebody... We've got a question from Pat okay, Cox in the chat room asking where the names, the bird names in golf came from. I don't know if either of you know. Do you know what? We probably should, but I don't. Do you, Mark? Which, I, I can answer it. Which mark are you asking? Whoever knows the answer. <laughs> so I, I know the answer because I did some research before, just in case we got asked the question. So oh, for those who don't know, Pat Simcox is a, is a very famous cricketer. And we both uh, spent time in Kimberley. And I know he's, Pat is a, is a very keen birder um, mm. as well. So basically, birdie is a score of one stroke under par, as we know. And it comes from the early 20th century. It's American slang. Um, there was American slang bird which meant anything excellent. It kind of started in September 1911, where there was a magazine article, and they, they spoke about you know, golf shots, a good golf shot being a bird, and yeah. subsequently that the name uh, arose. And eagle and albatross have just been extensions of that uh, term bird. Oh, okay. Thank you for that. Mm. And so thanks for the a, question, uh, Pat. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, nice to, to hear from Pat. Okay, so let me see if there's any others. Mark, um, Tony, to... what are the challenges of being the go-to birder when you're commentating and have to identify a bird? Well, it's a strange thing, you know, Mark. Um, we're out there for sort of two months a year and then back over here for 10 months. And 
every time I go back to South Africa, you know, because you're not seeing the bird life, you're not in the bush, it's amazing how much you forget. When you get back out there, you recognize the bird and you recognize the call, but it just doesn't come to you. So um, I try to go and spend a week in the bush somewhere prior to going out for the South African tournaments just to get things ticking over again because um, it's a liability, you know, when, when people think you're a knowledgeable birder because as soon as the bird comes up, they say, oh, Tony will know. And, you know, you're always a bit nervous of making it complete fool of yourself but um yeah you know i before we go out I, I look at my birding apps and get the bird books out which it's 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 not a hardship it's fun to get the mind ticking back over again so so tony when you're commentating and i often hear you commentating mm -hmm. um are you happy with me sending your whatsapp message and correcting you if you do make an error or would you rather I'm sure you've but had no. a few embarrassing experiences when, uh, when you've thought the mic was off and in fact it's, um, it's uh, still on. Yes, yes, we've had one. We had one. Um, few, Maybe not well, for public consumption. No, not for public consumption, but we were at uh, the Joburg Open um, and just before we went to a break, they showed one of the Coke girls on the tee. So we went to a break, you and Murray and I both switched off our mics and we were making some uh, some sort of, I suppose, fairly lurid comments. We're not too old for that, you know. Uh, and one of my buddies in Australia sent me a message and said, loving the conversation about the Coke girl. Turns out they had a spare mic behind the monitor. Oh my, and he was listening to him on the internet and we both sat there thinking, well, this could be our jobs. But uh, first thing you do is check that there's no spare mics when you go into a commentary box. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta be careful. So, um, Mark, um, Arno Elmer, who, who's met you at uh, Sundermere, yes. has asked about the crowned eagles at the moment. What stage mm. of nesting they are now? Is there any update on what, how they're doing? Probably one of the most so famous they, crowned eagle pairs in, in the country. Yeah, so they, um, they started for what the word is by Jacques, copulating and getting necky again about two or three weeks ago. And uh, it's the whole bonding stage now, right up to when they will lay their two eggs or whatever it is come August. So they're at the nest most days now, which is very, very nice to see. And uh, I kind of phone Jacques whenever I see them there. And it's almost every day now. Not that I'm going, go up there every single day, but nearly every day that I either go out to the shops or I take a quick trip in the mornings to see if they're there. They're there. So that's wonderful. Yeah. They're doing well. That's, that's well, those, I've, got, I've got to compliment you on those photos too. Jeez. Those photos are just unbelievable. And thanks for the help you've been giving me, Mr. McNulty, with uh, my new camera equipment. It's been a big help. You and my buddy Good. Colin Little and Joe Bird, I need help. I'm useless. <laughs> Good, TJ. No, man, it's, it's fun, isn't it? It's great fun. Yeah, it's wonderful. Peter Charland is asking whether there's any bird hides and golf courses in South Africa. And if yes, so, which courses? I don't know whether that's there are any golf courses with bird hides not that i'm aware of mm. maybe there's an opportunity and I, maybe yeah. while you're standing there addressing the ball it takes a sort of time tony then people could go and sit the bird hide and do a bit of bird watching and uh, they could go and find five lifers after i've hit one t-shirt <laughs> tony um, <laughs> daphne siegel is asking what is your favorite uk bird favorite uk bird would probably be the goldfinches we have a little flock of goldfinches that come into our garden i think i've had 42 species over the years uh, you know the the number of species in the uk is not that high compared to southern africa obviously we've got over 900 950 something like that but uh, the goldfinches come in, in a little flock and they're just so chirpy and cheerful so i go and sit out there every day and just watch them for a half an hour or so and just just chill feel mellow they do something to you, birds, don't they? They just it drains all the worries away. Okay. A beautiful then, bird, hey, TJ. Yeah, it's, yeah. The, uh, Mark, you know the goldfinch. It's got a red cap. Yes, I've, I don't think I've ever seen one, but I, in fact, people have been posting pictures of the last. Yeah, whoever's listening, they should look it up. It's a beautiful bird. Beautiful yes, bird. Yes. Um, Roger Mashin um, from Canon is thanking you for the Canon shout out, Mark, and 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 com complimenting you on your photographs. So he, he's oh appreciative of those photographs. And I think the, the, other, the three of us have a lot in common. We both, enjoy, all three of us enjoy golf and birds, but all three of us use Canon equipment. 
And Roger and I have been in correspondence the last week, and he's very keen to advertise in African BirdLife magazine. Maybe I'll just give a shout out for our magazine at the moment. We, we'd certainly mm. consider it to be one of the world's best bird and bird watching magazines. It's doing really well. It's available in retail. You can get it as a mm. membership benefit or as a direct subscription. For those who don't receive the magazine, I'd encourage you to, to, um, to subscribe. And you can drop me an email at theo at birdlife.org today or go to our website and get our details. And we're happy to send you details about how get, you get the magazine. It's not very expensive. Mark, it's one of my exciting occasions when it comes through my letterbox in the UK. I get, I really do. I get, I get an absolute buzz. It's a, it's a wonderful publication. You guys, it's, it's, and it, it always has been. Uh, the photos, the information. Can't wait for it to arrive every, every two months. Thanks, thanks, Tony. And we, yeah, we've had oh. a big difficulties lately because we've. During sure. lockdown, we couldn't print it, and now the, the magazines are sitting in a warehouse in, in uh, Cape Town. They'll be probably be able to post, uh, be posted on, on Monday, which but will be Mark, helpful. You were telling me as well that you've got a lot of back editions in your warehouse, and uh, for all golfers who, who don't know the magazine, I highly recommend it. It is, mm. it is one of the yeah. best magazines, as Tony said, in the world. Mm. And, you know, they can obviously offer us a little chat. They can maybe email you and and talk about back editions or yeah. even subscribe to the magazine because it's a fantastic magazine. Mm. So they, they collect as items and they don't take because, you know, it's about the natural yeah. history of the birds and, and they you know, print it really beautifully and people collect them. And we sometimes get requests that people have lost a back issue. It's got damaged as well. Do we have one in stock? And we do keep a supply of, of the back issues. The magazine's done really well and I really need to compliment our editor, Eve Gracie and her, her team. Okay, Kish Chetty, Kishlin Chetty, who um, works at Eskrim and is also a great friend of BirdLife um, South Africa, has asked, what is the best golf hole you've played on a course for viewing wildlife? So, CJ? Leopard Creek. Yep. Leopard Creek. 13 at Leopard Creek. I think we're, we're, every golfer that's played Leopard Creek would say that. You know, the green, the 13th green, the par five. Um, they actually built it up. It's... Uh, it's um, on an art, on artificial uh, posts and things and it, you literally look right down onto the crocodile river the Kruger Park is the other side so you know you look over there and you see crocodiles and hippos it's it's pretty awesome <laughs> and uh, it, Mark you, you, you remember um, playing at Palabora yes the, uh, 17 the 16th hole the par 5 that ran yes with down. a hippo yeah yeah. <laughs> um, that, the, the 16th hole way back, I don't yeah. know who I was playing with, but uh, when we got down to the green, there were two lions on the side of the fence, just next oh. to the green, yeah. watching us play practice run. Okay. So, well. <laughs> Alamora, but Leopard Creek is, is hands down will be the number one mm. for wildlife. Okay, mm. then talking about Leopard Creek, um, I don't know whether Johan and Gain or Rupert are joining this webinar, um, they may be. And Gaynor is a, is a strong supporter of BirdLife South Africa. She funds two of our positions at BirdLife South Africa, which we're grateful for, and in fact, including Melissa's position. And she's one of our four honorary patrons. And the chap in charge of her wine estate, Gary Baumgarten, has actually sent a message and asked what wines you drink while you're out bird. Whether you enjoy any Rupert food. Rothschild. <laughs> there we go. Red one. Um, I think we we're going to come to the end. It's an hour. I think we try and keep wow. this to an hour, and we're losing a few um, participants. Wow. I know that um, Melissa has a few things she'd like to say before we do close. Melissa, do you want to go on to that? Sure. Thanks, Mark. And just before I do, um, I see we got a few comments both on Facebook and in the the Q and A room, just saying that Sabi River Sun Golf Course has bird hides and they do regular walks on their golf course for birds. So oh, nice wow. to see that some of the golf mm. clubs are, are picking up on this wonderful hobby. Mm. And hopefully after this, we'll see a lot more clubs starting to do that too. So I just like, yep, go. Melissa, sorry, there's a Papa Mashaba. I'm not sure who he is. He's asking a question which you would probably be best to answer. What is the <laughs> most interesting but difficult bird to find or shoot in Kruger? Shoot sure. by meaning shoot with a camera. <laughs> I mean, I hope so. <laughs> Papa, sure. Um, for me, it would probably be your uh, three-banded Corsa up in the north of Kruger Park. 
Um, it's a very, very elusive and well camouflaged bird, and you really need to know where they're, where they're hiding out in those mapani leaves to be able to find them. Um, but I think there's a number of really good specials up in the north of Kruger that could probably get onto that list, the likes of racket-tailed rollers and southern hyliotas. Great question. Okay. Melissa, well, then um, Robin Gray, I think he's asking a few questions uh, he's, and, he, and comments, and he just said there's a bird hide at, um, I've lost the, the comment of Francis. Prince's Grant. On Prince's the Grant 16th Golf Hall. Course, 16th, right. yeah. Yes. So there's one hide too. Maybe this is something that, Anybody who's involved with golf courses should probably look at um, a bird hide, even if it's near the clubhouse, could be could be quite useful. Yeah, yeah. great idea. Absolutely. Our colleague Ernst Retiff has done a great um, hide design information booklet, so I'm sure he'd love to share those with some of the golf courses. Mm. Okay, so um, yeah, maybe I'll just say, Tony and Mark, thanks very much. I've really enjoyed this, and I've enjoyed getting to know both of you during the last while, and really appreciate your time and, and also your support for, for BirdLife South Africa and giving us a punt whenever you can. A lot of people are posting similar messages as well, I see, just thanking you for, the, for the, uh, all you do for, for us and for conservation. So thank you. Thanks for that. Thank thank you. Thank you. Thanks for inviting us. Thank, yeah, you. thank you. And from my side as well, uh, Mark, Tony and Mark, thank you all so much. That was an absolutely fascinating conservation conversation and something a little bit different, which I think is really served the purpose of reaching out to a broader audience than we typically have. So thank you both for, for coming online with us and sharing your love of nature and golf. So just a reminder to everyone tuning in, as you leave, you'll be directed to a short three minute survey and we'd encourage all of you to just complete that for us. It really does help us keep bringing you up to date and relevant information in these webinars. Next week's webinar is going to see BirdLife Spatial Planning and Data Manager, Ernst Retiff, providing us with an in-depth look into the incredible citizen science initiative that is the Southern African Bird Atlas Project, or SABAP, as it is known to many of us. So please make sure to sign up for that if you haven't yet. And we really look forward to sharing some of the incredible atlasing work that's been done around South Africa and how BirdLife South Africa is benefiting from those citizen science initiatives. So same time next week, 7 p.m. Tune in and join us live on Zoom or Facebook. And until next time, keep your eyes outside and on the skies and enjoy those birds. I'll see you next week, everybody. Thank you all so much. Good night. Thank you, Melissa. Good night, guys. Thank you all. Have a good evening. Thanks, guys. Take care. Thank you.